Um, many years ago, uh, a pharmaceutical executive came to us from Johnson & Johnson and said, we'd really like you to help us sort of tell the story of type 2 diabetes. And they gave us this statistic that 92% of type 2 diabetics who have a chronic condition cannot even define to you their own disease. So the idea is that we were listening to them and saying, my God, you know, is this because the largest industry in the world, healthcare, have the shittiest storytellers? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you take a look at insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies, and that's not to say that they don't do their best, but it's not, it's not part of their DNA. And uh, we thought we could actually take a better shot at it we had been doing this for many, many years uh, and visualizing very large data sets of the human body. I'll just back up a little bit to give you a little personal background as how we got here. Um, I was offered a position as associate professor of medicine and chief of scientific visualization at Yale and Department of Surgery, um, brought there by one of my um, uh, leaders from DARPA. And my job was to write most of the algorithms and code for NASA to do virtual surgery. Uh, writing algorithms and code for, on supercomputers to do virtual surgery in preparation for the astronauts going into deep space flights so they could be cut in robotic pods. Um, before that, I was a journalist at Time Inc. for about 15 years. And then before that, I was actually trained as a painter and a sculptor. Uh, I actually even went to RISD, one of the many schools I was thrown out of. But uh, <laughs> so the thing is that I thought if we actually used our, our artistic and our storytelling and our technology, we could do so much better than all these other people and really move the dial on type 2 diabetes and really get people to sort of have that holy shit, I finally get it moment. Uh, because one of the things we were recognizing is the fact that what we had in the industry at the moment is a thing called obligatory compliance. Do it because an expert tells you to do it. And inevitably, there's a fall off, a tremendous fall off. And I was just lecturing in Southeast Asia, problems, same problems there. And we felt like if we could really tell you that kind of compelling story, that we could actually change the paradigm and make it inspirational compliance. Do it because you get it, because you're a partner in the process. In the end, what happened was that we were somewhat arrogant and we didn't really change the dot. We could actually inspire people for a longer period of time, but, and the stories were beautiful and they were comprehensive and people, you know, plotted it, but the thing is that we didn't move the dial. And the reason is that people have tremendous deniability. It's always a proxy story, it's not you. And so we're sitting there saying, oh my God, how do I tell everyone the story of every billions of people, your individual story? As I was looking at it, I'm sitting there saying, okay, well let's get away from scientific visualization, let's look at some other programs where basically know who you are, where you are at any point in time. If you really look at it, it's something like Google Maps. It knows a lot about you, whether you're eating pizza, whether you're where you are, all this kind of information. So I looked at the history of, of Google Maps, and it was actually starting off with a company called Keyhole. What they did is they picked up all of the NASA pictures from 90, 1956 to the present. They digitized them, those that weren't digitized. They basically created a content management system, and they knew the longitudinal latitude of studies of the Earth and basically mapped it, Re even working with a little you know, kind of widget. And what happened is Google saw it at a TED conference thought it was beautiful and said, let's buy it. We don't know what we're going to do with it. So I said, you know, the thing is, it's interesting is that at, when I was at Yale and other places, at DARPA and these other places, we had been scanning every part of the human body from the moment of conception until advanced age, every aspect of it from the molecular to the gross anatomy. So I had the NASA equivalent of all the body parts and pathologies over time. And I could write a content management system. But what is our longitudinal lab study that is of each person's body. We found it in a thing called HL7, in which most people have never heard of. But basically, what most people don't really understand, you're all already coded. HL7 was a standardization of called Health Level 7, now international, where we had to have a standardization that basically allowed someone to say, this pathology is this number, and this is the degree, and here are the lab reports they're getting, and here are the drugs they're taking, and they're standardized. So every electronic medical record in the world, every government, you can take your medical records from one place to another, and can they just be imported? And so we're sitting there saying, okay, let's take HL7, but the problem is, HL7 is like looking at hieroglyphics. Your medical records are like looking at hieroglyphics. And since we were sitting there saying, it's a lot of data, but we need to turn it into a story, so every part of that 
you know, millions of codes, we took and basically coded it to a story that actually turns your body into a story of you and not the statistics of you. So let me show you how we did it. Um, the first part is you actually have to take four kind of mega parts of the industry. You have to take one of the largest visual libraries in the world and code it in great detail. You have to build a 1,100,000 code system, content management system, that takes every piece of code and then marries it to your personal health record. So that when the data comes in and we see those hieroglyphics, we strip that crap out and send you a beautiful story of what that hieroglyphic actually means, converting you into a story that understands from your lab reports to the drugs. And the next part we're doing is we're building a practice management system that will allow any institution in the world to use our system to build their own platform to write a protocol to manage you. It doesn't make any difference what the conditions are. So I'll, sh I'll work through each one of these for you so that you can get a kind of a clear understanding. So the first part was big, taking all of this content, all of this information, and having to convert it. We wanted to make it beautiful, visceral and visual, but every aspect of it, you know, whether you're talking about a cancer, the information had to be in here in detail. So what we did is we partnered with the NIH, um, uh, CDC, and a number of other groups, National Library of Medicine, and what we did is we converted the content. The problem with a lot of the government organizations it have great content, you just can't find it. It's like what they used to say about uh, the internet before search. It was like walking into the Library of Congress, except all the books were on the floor. And that's what it's like when you actually go out searching for this data. So what we have to do is take all of this kind of rich data and visualize every part of it, code it, and be able to send it to you at any point every aspect of whatever kind of question you may be asking yourself during this period of time is now visualized. Early detection. Giving you, whether it's in stage one, two, or three, or four, all the information is here last. for each stage of that period. With this, it doesn't make any difference what the disease state is. We have over 2,000 uh, disease conditions. And what we did is we matched it up so that at the bottom of all of this, not only would you get a beautiful video with every article, illustrations, information about every part of it, but at the end, you would also get related topics, cancer prevention, screening, various kinds of biomarkers that would be necessary. People always talking about you know, BRCA, you know, genetic testing. So what we also had to do was write one of the kind of largest biomarker libraries where we read your biomarkers and now we tell you a beautiful story of what the biomarker, but also, if you're in the positive range or no matter what may be, we now have the story of what relative program that, this is all now going to be sent to you automatically as we see them. And we call it a time of need or a time of want. A time of need is you've been flagged. A time of want is maybe you're a caretaker for a parent or a child. So with this, we realized the fact that we had so many stories that had to be, and we wanted to, you know, basically, uh, allow physicians or people to educate themselves just beyond the disease state. Because a lot of times when people, when we would tell a story when I was at Time, it was a very simple formula. You know, uh, the marvel of how you're made is part one. What went wrong? And, and the third is, what do I do about it? And so the problem is, it's very hard for physicians to explain to you what went wrong when you don't have that first. And I don't call it um, you know, the anatomy, I call it the marvel, because when you actually look at a functioning, you know, biological presence, when you take a look at the heart functioning and the coronary arteries, I mean, the way they function, the complexities are just an absolute marvel. So we wanted to give people an understanding of also the normal, because we had so many beautiful kind of normal, but again, in video format, whether we're talking about the pathology or using our visualization technology, coming back to the kind of uh, idea whether you're talking about lipoprotein, again, the biomarkers that are necessary, all the different kinds of biomarkers that you would want during this period of time, what they would represent, atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, heart attack, peripheral, you know, all of them, again, are within the system. But one of the parts that we really wanted to have was the, um, the arteries themselves, the just, just normal arteries, just what does it look like? And if a physician wants to explain to you 
the beauty of it, we built galleries for them, for people to educate themselves on the normal, as well as galleries to build on the pathologies. So you have videos on the normal, you have videos on the pathologies, and now they can actually use our interactive tools and they can say this coronary, I've got a 3D heart here, and this is the artery that I'm actually going to do the stent. So each step along the way was to facilitate someone to give you that holy shit, I finally get it moment. At the same time, we kept on pushing the envelope on content, building little Java apps and things like that. What's it feel like to be a dyslexic? You know, so it was always just pushing them. And we we're only talking about the four platforms we had to build. We we're just still looking at the first one. But the idea was to build it so it answered all of your questions and in a visceral and visual manner. And with this, whether you're talking about dyslexia or you're talking about Alzheimer's disease, you could see the beautiful jirai and sukai of the brain that are holding, folding, that increase the capacity to hold more and more memories. All of this was, you know, just sort of melts away. And as you have this before and after, but again, you have at the end of this, you have all the information, the risks, the causes, the signs, videos for each and every one. You have the, you know, the proper text, uh, related information, the, the biomarkers that you should be testing for. Alzheimer's caregivers also, we were concerned about people because my mother had Alzheimer's and it was, it was crazy. My, you know, with her four brothers and one of the, the eldest brother who was, uh, second oldest brother who was the principal caretaker, anytime anything happened to my mother, changed the drug, had a TIA, anything that went on, would have to find one brother in Singapore, the other brother in Athens, one didn't have, you know, the understanding of the medical. We should have one program that could be shared that everyone can get on, which I'll show you in a moment of how that works. That you could see everything, and you log in the morning, you can actually watch everything that's going on, and your mother and all the brothers would be sharing that information at one time. Now, so how does part two? So the part two was building this huge content management system with over 1,100,000 codes. And in it, you have the CVXs are for vaccines, your HL7 is your overall, the international classification of disease, some are, have not updated from nine to 10, we have both of them. Low ink, all your lab reports, all your diagnostics. You know, down here we've got Rx norm for your drugs. One of the fascinating things that we found is that as we were looking to sort of solve the problem of what we call dirty data, because really all these decisions that are being made about you, by you and by the other communities, is really based on the dirty data. Uh, when I say dirty data, they do not have a complete picture of you. When you go to a hospital and you leave, you go off your drugs. Why did you go off your drug? Did you couldn't afford it? You felt better, you felt worse? There's so many pieces of information about you that gets cobbled. Your, your whole life is cobbling your own records together and then basically these large institutions that say we have so much data on you, it's shitty data. We're trying to create a new standard of data which is basically clinical coupled with behavioral over time. Now, these are two trillion dollar industries. Clinical is a trillion dollar industry. It's hospitals, it's your medical records. Behavioral is wellness, prevention. It's a billion dollar industry. In these million 100,000 codes, there is not one code for joy. There's not one code for love. There's not one code for happiness. There's not one code for exercise. There's not one code for nutrition. So you can see the industry is made only to manage a sickness. And if in essence we are going to change this, we have to bring these two things together and look at them over time. So what we did is we imported a system called MESH, which is used by PubMed, basically academic papers, which do indeed, it's not really used this way, but we're using it, we're coding it because it has these other codes in them, and we're going to use them to sort of marry the behavioral so that we have a complete picture of you. And with these, every one of these, you can get as, we, as you can see, all the metadata is built into the system. These are the ICD codes. All this information is here. And you can see in your Rx norms, there's 2,729 pages of drugs that you're looking at here along the way. So there's a lot of coding that has to match up against your storyline. But you are made out of thousands of little biological stories that we want to help you interpret and understand and manage. Because if you don't, that is, that is 
going to be to your detriment. I mean, the, you will not achieve well-being if you do not own yourself. And once you own yourself, you have control over these diagnostics and these treatments and these options that you now are not a patient of, you are a partner of your well-being. So from here, we wanted to say from the moment, not, we want you to have one medical record from preconception until advanced age. And what's really fascinating about this is I, I just uh, keynoted a, um, a big life insurance company, and this was one of these life insurance companies where you have to have a portfolio of 20 million and above. To, and there's all these wealthy people there, and the chairman of the insurance company said, you know, Alexander, I was just you know, at the Mayo Clinic, and I just got a virtual colonoscopy, but you know, I was playing golf in Florida, and you know, I had a little cardiac episode that got scanned there. But I live in New York City, and I'm, I'm, you know, I have a rotator cuff problem I'm getting scanned at the hospital for special surgery. And his name was Alex. I said, Alex, I mean, this is, I said, this is, this is fucking nuts, man. I said, you know, in one year, your, your colon's in Minnesota, your heart's in Florida, and your shoulder's in New York. I mean, you are, you know, you're spread around the world. You should have one medical record that goes with you, that you own yourself. So from the time from preconception, IVF, Every piece of that information is in here to guide you through that program. A person can open up, we made it like a Netflix, so that basically you just keep on wanting to scroll and look at information on and on and on. But every question that you could have within this category. Now, a person who may be actually using it to manage their journey, this is a, now you're going to the third part, which is the personal health record. This was a very interesting thing to build because you have to be both HIPAA and GDPR compliant, which are the kind of privacy laws of Europe and America and make sure that basically people's materials are safe. But what you find that older people are absolutely paranoid of anyone seeing their medical records, and young people share everything, you know, and it's crazy. And so you're building a program where you can share uh, and still be, you know, tightly compliant was a, was a challenge, but we ended up doing it. But as you can see here, this woman, Beth, can, you know, basically she, has, she can invite users, she can create a community, she can create a group, she can manage a group, she can actually invite her provider. Uh, all this information, she can import her medical records using a CCD, which is called a continuity care document. All, everyone always talks about electronic medical records, but there is an interchangeability, you know, either fire or CCD, a continuity care document that you can import. And, it's, and people keep on saying, oh, medical records, um, uh, you know, are we going to really go there? Well, listen, 15 years ago, you would have never thought of having a port financial portfolio online. You should have a health portfolio online. You know, you upload your bank statement, you know, to a secure server, you download it, and that's it, and it just downloads forever. We do the same thing here. You upload your CCD, your doctor uploads it, and by law, now, what most people do not understand, and you must, you own your medical record. Now, not legally, in the United States, in 48 states, the institution owns you except for Alaska and New Hampshire. Only there do you actually own your data. But by law, if you ask for your data, they must give it to you. And so once you get it, you own yourself. All your data will be converted into a story. And with that story, you can now start to input uh, all this kind of information. So there's a person who basically uh, truncated it so that you know, we can actually go through it relatively quickly. As you saw some of the IVF information, there's a woman who's going through IVF She's asking the kind of common questions that most people are going backwards now because uh, she's already gone through. This is a timeline base. She said, went to see the doctor. You know, she's talking, she found the article and she found this topic. Bob wanted to finally see, you know, see if I, about a fertility doctor. She doesn't know whether it's her husband or if it's her. So basically her husband gets the sperm test, gets the sperm analysis, all the information, which all the data will come into their program, finds out that Bob is okay. She finds out the polycystic ovarian syndrome. She's noting her age and these other. So it's a, it's, a, it's a personal health diary where you're basically going through all the kinds of questions that you can actually, one place from the moment of preconception until advanced age where you will keep your records, the family records, your child's records, all of this information. Now she's taking a look at her ovarian reserve profile and all of this goes back and she can upload share information, she's uploading here her own picture, she can annotate it of the egg that is being implanted back and she finds out that she's pregnant and then she goes into the pregnancy. 
There's no reason, for, this, is a, this, is, this is totally nuts. On average, women, we've been working on this for a long time because uh, when in the early days I worked with a guy named Paul Lauterborough and I wrote all the algorithms and code with the NIH to watch the development of the fetus from conception to birth. Paul had designed the micromagnetic resonance machine. So we had been collecting and been looking at this topic for many years. Paul went on to win the Nobel Prize for inventing the MRI. I get the data. I, I think I got the better part of the deal. <laughs> um, but one of the things we recognize is that women will use five different places to research their pregnancy and four different places to store their data. The moment they give birth, that record is worthless. Now they have, they're cobbling. As I mentioned the word cobbling earlier, they're cobbling. Now they're going to start a new cobbled record for themselves postpartum, and they're going to begin to cobble a record for their child. Should have one record from the moment of preconception until advanced age that's basically a partnering with you to basically help you understand your pathway to well-being. So as she goes through this, and as you know, she's asking questions about infant formula, she's uploading pictures of her child, what's going on in the second month of development. Now, this, there's a, I, I just took highlights from the storyline, but the thing is that she can upload and, and input, and one of the things that she wants, she can actually input her glucose, she can actually import it from a wearable. It doesn't make any difference. The information is you know, time-based, if it's type one diabetic. And so fundamentally, if she wants to go and then actually look at her information very quickly, she can actually take only the kind of information that she needs to look at very quickly here on a, on a board. And then she can input and pull it out. So we're basically building little apps for them to basically be able to input and take data out really, really quickly. So every one of these conditions that you're looking at will have a little app that allows you. Then she goes on, you know, puts in the information, and we will then, because we know your timeline, this is sometimes when people get, they're afraid because you get too much data on them, but sometimes data can actually work to your advantage, because now I know where you are on your timeline. I can help you out in the sense of the marvel or what's going on inside your body. I can help, I can send you bots of information that is relevant to your experience. The idea is that data is, is now a negative thing when I have data, but data could be a wonderful thing. It can actually help you along the way, every part from the marvel of how you're made to when things go wrong. And so, you know, who, who wouldn't want to get this kind of weekly of how, here's how your child's eye is developing inside the womb. All of this kind of beautiful information that we know where you are on the timeline, we can now continue to send this to, information to you. But one of the problems people say, oh, there are apps, there are apps for pregnancy, there are apps. People are complicated. What happens if you have uh, a premature child? What happens if your child ends up in the NICU? Once again, you're deer in the headlight and you're cobbling. And here, all the information, whether it's preeclampsia, no matter what the disease condition, the information is here to help you, guide you through whatever the process is. And you'll be able to monitor your child at a distance. You'll be able to leave the NICU and go home and see the vitals, because basically everything will be pumped into the system. People are complicated. You know, the thing is, she has asthma, uh, and she wants to see whether her drugs are contraindicated with her, you know, with pregnancy. All that information has to be in the system. Now, I'll show you how, in, in a kind of a, a short video, how it could be actually used during a period of time of pregnancy. StoryMD is a platform that allows you to track, understand, and act on your health data. Let's see how one mother is using it as she experiences pregnancy for the first time. Jill is pregnant and expecting her first child. She's become a mobile heart, lung, blood, and immunological incubator as her body changes to nurture and protect her soon-to-be baby. She's indicated to StoryMD her date of conception, so the platform's pregnancy bot can provide her with weekly updates explaining and visualizing the marvel of her baby's development. For example, Jill learns of the astounding development in her baby's brain as he or she learns to hear, smell, taste, and swallow. Now Pregnancy Bot notifies Jill of an upcoming set of tests, her second trimester screening, also known as a quad test. Having followed a link to the health library to learn more about the quad test, she finds out what her results could mean. After she receives her results, she can quickly and easily add them to her health journal. 
How did she get them? Her physician may have given her an electronic personal health record, called a CCD, or Continuity of Care document, and uploaded that file directly to StoryMD. Otherwise, she can upload her results manually, as we've seen her doing here. Her journal visualizes her results, giving her additional context into what each of those numbers means. Besides keeping track of all that data in one place, Jill can now securely share her experience with family, friends, and trusted healthcare providers, and receive feedback from her doctor right on her timeline, letting them participate in the beauty of her pregnancy. Once the baby has arrived, she can even create an account for her with its own dashboard where she can manage upcoming tests and vaccinations and keep track of important health markers, reminders, and conversations with doctors. To begin using StoryMD to track, understand, and manage your... All you're looking at is data. But by converting this data into a story, that's why we always say it's, it's, it's story that gives a soul to data. And that is the critical part. People from the time of Homer, you know, to the great writers in, in the south of the USA, have always been great storytellers on a porch. All I want to do is turn your body into that magnificent story and allow you to understand it. Now, I'll give you a kind of a, give you a personal kind of an interesting insight that I had recently um, with my son. 16 years old, I uh, was playing basketball, had an ACL tear. Uh, goes up to the hospital for special surgery. We live in New York City. Uh, scared to death, has never been on a gurney in his life. And there's a young girl right next to him. She's scared to death. They don't speak to each other. So what happens, I was fascinated. Uh, what happened after this was that, as we're looking at the ACL, he is now, in the next three days, reintroduced to that girl from his friends on Snapchat and 22 other kids who had had that operation in the past week create an ad hoc group, and they're all competing against each other about who's freezing the knee more. Hey, why did you have the graft from your groin and I had it from my kneecap? People are hungry for this information. They are desperately hungry, and the idea is if you can service them at their time of need or want, then basically they will be able to actually service what is going on inside their body and those they love, even your pets. And I'll give you one last, as we have all the information on pets because it's part of the family member. And I, we take this very seriously because fundamentally, here is my wife and my puppy dog, who's the, who's a, a service dog at the Ovarian Cancer Center. And she is a member of our family. But fundamentally, this program is a very simple premise. It is the story of you over time that allows you to truly manage your well-being into the future and that of those you love. Thank you.